Hello, can everybody hear me? That sounds good and loud, actually. Well, welcome to another program of the Monroe County History Club. My name is Michael Carter, and welcome to my wife, Paulette, and my cousins. My brother Steve's usually here, but he had to work today. He has a real job. Uh, well, I, I don't talk about sports hours ever, but I, I'm still worn out for the, the IU women's game yeah. last night. But, uh, we, we were there, and I almost had to go to the nervous hospital <laughs> after it was over. But it, it was fun to watch, though. So. Uh, many thanks to the American Legion for allowing us to host these presentations for the last 11 years now. And, uh, you know, it, it's a good thing it's, 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 it's a legion. It's a perfect place for us. It's uh, for what we do. And thanks so much to their wait staff uh, who do such a great job every time. Please be generous with the servers. Uh, also, I'd like to thank Cats TV and their, their 50th anniversary is coming up. So they've been at this for quite a while now. Uh, real public servants. And you know, it's a very important service to us. It, it allows us to upload each program to YouTube for people who can't make it to these programs. And there are people all over the country that watch these transplanted uh, Bloomingtonians uh, because they let me know. So it's kind of a neat thing that we, you know, they can see these. Uh, and the idea here is pre to preserve as much local history as we possibly can. And, and CATS allows us to do just that. Uh, there are, in fact, several local history organi related organizations in town. And we all try and support and work with each other to preserve our history. Besides us, there's a history center, which I'm a, a board member and have been for two or three years the Monroe County Public Library, IU Photo Archives, of course I mentioned Catch TV, uh, the Wiley House Museum, and probably other places too. Also our local history enthusiasts who attend and watch these programs so much, and uh, uh, you've given us great support over the years. And you know, the ones we present here, I, I'm kind of proud of them because they're so diverse with many different subjects covered. We've had presentations on Stone Mills and Quarries of the area, RCA, Showers Brothers, local post offices, history of the Hoosier hysteria, of all things, old photos from the Herald Telephone, Herald Times, Barnes, City Parks, the Monon Railroad, and West Baden even, even though that's not Monroe County, it's close enough. Uh, how many, do we have any new attendees today? Okay. Uh, now, if there are, you want to get on our regular mailing list, just go ahead and uh, give me your email address, and I'll see that George Carpenter adds it. And uh, oh, one of our original people are here today. I haven't seen her for a while. Billy Link Moore is here. She was one of our very first people uh, to attend these way back when, in 2013. At right now, I'd like to introduce Daniel uh, Schlegel of the uh, History Center to say a few words. Thanks, Michael. Um, I just want to give a quick reminder to everyone that we set up over here, we have all kinds of new photos this time, so if anyone hasn't had a chance to look at some of the photos that the HT archive donated to us, feel free to take a look at them, any information you may have on them, people, places, times, anything you might think or suspect, definitely let us know. And then we have some items from our store. Um, I talked to a few people who were shocked to find out there's an eclipse coming in a few weeks. <laughs> um, but we do, have, we do have some merchandise, so if you want magnets or stickers, I know a lot of places are selling uh, the glasses. I brought our last three out of 200 glasses. Um, I did bring our last three if you need a pair, but we have some other items related to the eclipse if you want a memento or to give one to someone else. And we also have our big garage sale coming up in June. So if anyone is doing some spring cleaning, or just cleaning up and clearing out some items, please feel free to think of us. The donations are on Wednesdays from 10 to 2, and then our big sales in June. Uh, so I'll make sure that I have a lot more as that gets closer, but I do have handouts if anyone needs one of those. And then we do have new exhibits up. Our transportation exhibit just reopened. So if anyone saw the previous one, <clears throat> we still have trains and a big wagon involved. 
but we've also introduced an early airplane that flew here in Monroe County over in Dun Meadow. We also have a lot more about the waterways and how people arrived here. We have a lot more about automobiles. So we pulled a lot of neat stuff out of the collections to put on display. So make sure to come on down and see all the new exhibits we have. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Daniel. Here's a brief rundown, just the titles of uh, some of our coming attractions. And we're scheduled just about a, a year ahead, like usual. Uh, next month, April 30th, will be Christine Friesel, who's uh, been a frequent presenter, a program called Who's Your Character? A Digital Map of the 19th Century Locally. Uh, May 28th, Roger Robeson, who's also given a couple of programs. We'll give a program, uh, State Championship Teams from Monroe County High Schools, 1904 to 2014. Uh, June 25th, Kurt Sylvester, state president of the uh, Indiana Genealogical Society, will give a program on some of the early settler families of Monroe County, who they were and what they brought to this county. July 30th, uh, a look at the history of Catch TV. They're going to have a program for themselves, which I mentioned they'll be turning 50 here real soon. August 27th, John Summerlot. Uh, a look at raci racially restrictive property covenants in Monroe County's past. Something I didn't know anything about. Uh, so that sounds interesting. September 24th, uh, we're giving equal time to our old uh, counterpart in the high, local high schools. I went to Bloomington High School. This is a history of university high school. Uh, since we already did one on the old BHS, it's, it's their turn. Uh, September 24th by Dina Kellums of uh, IU Archives. And then October 29th, 2024, History of Bloomington, Monroe County by Glenda Murray. She's the official historian of Monroe County. November 26th, uh, Smithville, Indiana, Pioneers, Skibos, and Lake Monroe. Rosie Gersman will uh, introduce you to family names and individuals that helped the area of Monroe County flourish and int uh, introduce education and sports. December is still open. I'm not sure we'll have one in December. It may be too close to Christmas. We'll see if that's open. January 28th, uh, Clay and I just came to an agreement about this. It looks like uh, he, he's going to do a presentation for us on January 28th next year called The Holy Family is uh, Pioneer Stoneman. And uh, also, we're going to withhold this. If, if somebody has to cancel real quick, Clay's going to step in there, by golly, and give it ahead of time. But... Uh, if not, we'll see him in January do that. And on February 25th, uh, the woman who just gave our last program, Jill Vance, will give a program called uh, The Mormons Come to Salt Creek Valley. So that's different. Uh, I didn't know they came to Salt Creek Valley, but uh, she does, so we'll, she'll talk about that. Uh, so we get around to today's presenter, Nan Brewer. Uh, the name of her program is Art at IU from the early fine arts collection to the Eskenazi Museum of Art. Uh, Nan served as uh, curatorial in the curatorial department at the Eskenazi Museum of Art for more than 37 years, first as acting curator of 19th and 20th century art, and then as curator of exhibitions before heading the prints, drawings, and photographs department beginning in 1991, retiring in February. During her tenure at the museum, Nan organized or managed more than 90 exhibitions and more than 120 gallery installations. So Nan, your time. Well, good afternoon. Um, just to start, um, I'm not from Moe County um, or even a Hoosier. My interest in Indiana art and the history of the Eskenazi, Eskenazi School of Art, Architecture, and Design in the Eskenazi Museum of Art began when I was hired in uh, 1988 as the acting curator of 19th and 20th century art by the museum's then acting director, Heidi Gelt. Shortly thereafter, she asked if I would do an exhibition for the governor's celebration of the arts in the state. It was a bit like a Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland, let's put on a show moment. Um, 
Although I knew about art, American art history in general, I had to learn everything about the history of Indiana art, like the Hoosier Group, the Richmond School, the Brown County Art Colony, and about the various art collections around campus. We didn't have any money to borrow from outside of the university. It was my first big show, and I decided to include artists from both the 19th century as well as contemporary artists. As such, I had to quickly learn about the teacher artists um, from IU. I continued this research as the organizer of the School of Fine Arts Biennial Faculty Shows for 20 years, including writing a short history of the department in 1991. This talk will primarily focus on a little known art collection called a museum by its organizer from long before the Eskenazi Museum of Art founding in 1941 as well as the use of archival materials in my research and a bit about the fine arts department and museum's later history. All right, let's see if I can get this to move on. I also have become sort of the de facto historian of the museum in part because I worked under three of our four directors, as well as knowing the first one. <laughs> so gives me a little bit of background. However, my journey to rediscover the early history of IU's fine arts collection began indirectly with the discovery in 1987 of an unidentified stack of drawings by the regionalist artist Thomas Hart Benton for the Indiana murals that are now housed at the U Indiana University campus. Perhaps I can come back um, and talk about that masterworks for you at a, at a later time. In my attempts to establish the chronology of these working drawings, I noticed small red circled numbers on the backs of some of the sheets. Was this nomenclature part of the artist's methodology corresponding to the squares of his enlargements? Were they part of an inventory system? Nothing seemed to correspond directly with what, uh, directly, nor did I notice any similar notations on the drawings for any of Benton's previous mural cycles. Around that same time, I discovered several boxes of unidentified, unaccessioned prints and drawings in some very old and ragged museum cases. The works were generally in poor, very poor condition and unmatted. Surprisingly, I discovered that they also had that same style, red penciled circled numbers on the backs. I was also occasion I also occasionally found some num such numbers on some of the accession works in the museum's collection, although relatively small number. What was this numbering system? It didn't correspond to the museum's accession numbers going back to our earliest records in 1941 or any of our old loan numbers. The answer came in the came in an early fine arts collection that far predated the official beginning of the Eskenazi Museum, formerly known as the Indiana University Art Museum. I knew that the university had collected some artworks prior to the museum's founding that were displayed at the IU Auditorium, Indiana Memorial Union, dormitories, and even the men's gymnasium but I had never heard of the, I had never heard about a unified fine arts teaching collection. Around 1990, I was going through some old museum files and stumbled across an appraisal of prints and a corresponding list of prints, drawings, and watercolors in the fine arts department on this old, fragile iron, uh, onion skin paper. To my delight, the cataloging numbers matched the red circled numbers that I had found. Although the appraisal was unsigned and undated, 
I discovered through a letter to um, President Bryan in the IU archives from the fine arts um, professor, Harry Engel, that was conducted in 1936 by Mr. Dunbar Roulet, Art Galleries in Chicago. Not only did I now know the identification of this material as part of a pre-museum um, holdings of the fine arts department, but I also had a sense of the scope of this collection. The appraisal not only listed the artist and titles and provided monetary evaluations, but in some cases an assessment of the print quality. The highest amount assigned was $200. For the angel approaching Joachim from Albrecht Durer's The Life of the Virgin, which I had on view right before the pandemic, although many of the prints were appraised for 25 cents. <laughs> A 1921 report to the IU Bursar of the Fine Arts Department's property, and this was considered property, gave the value for the same Durer plate as $25. So it had gone up. The 1936 appraisal lists more than a thousand items, primarily drawings and prints. <coughs> Although the list helped to answer some questions, it opened up many others, particularly about the origins of the IU's fine arts department. <coughs> and the late 19th century taste and pedagogy that it reflected. What opportunities did young Hoosiers in the late 19th century have to learn about art, or even to see art by professional artists? The simple answer is not much. <laughs> Aspiring artists often had their first artistic encounters with itinerant painters traveling through the state. Others, like the American Impressionist T.C. Steele, found rudimentary art instructions at small religious colleges or even from self-taught artists who were eking out a living doing portraits or working through photo for photography studios. Those who were lucky enough to encounter the state's few artists who had trained in Europe were limited. Two Indiana-born artists who left the state for New York and Chicago before heading to Paris and Munich for future training were John Love and James Gukins. Together, they opened the private Indiana School of Art in 1877. Although it lasted only two years, it encouraged many others, like Steele, William Forsythe, J. Otis Adams, and Samuel Richards, to follow their path and study abroad, especially at the Munich Royal Academy. This new crop of artists returned home rather than relocating, like William Eric Chase, to the East Coast. In 1902, the John Heron Art Institute opened to, as the state's first official art school it employed some of the, these professionally trained artists. However, this talk will focus on a lesser known aspect of the state's early art education within the walls of a so-called private I, public ivy, IU. Fortuitously, the uh, advent of the 50th anniversary of the IU Art Museum in 1991 and the 100th anniversary of the School of Fine Arts in 1995 spurred my research at the IU Archive, where I read early histories of the universities, reports to the president and board of trustees minutes, scanned our beautish yearbooks, and combed through, through the files on Alfred Mansfield Brooks in the Fine Arts Department. In the summer of 1896, a 26-year-old art historian and recent graduate of Harvard University, Alfred Mansfield Brooks had made the long trek across country to a relatively young Indiana University in the remote town of Bloomington. 
He brought with him the ideology of his teachers, Charles Herbert Moore, Charles Elliot Norton, and Herbert Langford Warren, who were disciples of the English artist and theorist John Ruskin. Indeed, Brooks thought of IU as a direct descendant of the grand traditions founded at Oxford and Harvard universities, writing in the IU's 1900 yearbook, in size and equipment they differ, in purpose they are one. You know, to imagine coming to start this department with that kind of vision in mind. Indiana University began as a small seminary school in 1820 and it had only recently moved to its current campus and began to establish itself as the state's official um, university. The nine years under IU President Joseph Swain, 1893 to 1902, were a period of unusual growth and prosperity. The class of 1894, for instance, during their four-year matriculation, had seen the faculty grow in numbers from 28 to 45, the library from 13,000 volumes to nearly 2,000, and the student body almost double from 321 to 636. Swain was a progressive Quaker who subsequently left IU for the presidency of Swarthmore College. What initially attracted Swain to adding art instruction as a recognized university subject, as he indicated in 1895 IU President's Report to the Board of Trustees, was that he thought drawing, both freehand and mechanical, could teach a practical skill. As such, he said, it is, an, it is imminently a practical one and much needed in several of the scientific courses. This is perhaps not surprising as Swain had taught mathematics and biology at IU before serving as its president and recognized the need for good scientific illustration, kind of a part of the classification teachings at that time. Brooks, however, not surprisingly, had grander ambitions for the program. Brooks became the first art instructor of the new Department of Freehand and Mechanical Drawing, which didn't even offer a degree. The curriculum focused on the appreciation of great works of uh, the works of great masters rather than on practical art training for what one of Brooks' professors had called a great gentleman's education. <coughs> However, perhaps feeling that it would be seen as a kind, as some kind of finishing school curriculum, the administration at IU quickly defended it as serious work on par with other academic subjects, not, quote, an opportunity for schoolgirls to learn a smattering of painting unquote. Brooks was paid an annual salary of $800. He initially taught only two courses, fine arts course with 32 students and a history of architecture with eight. He also provided, was provided with an equipment budget of $250 with which to outfit a single lecture and drawing room on the third floor of Kirkwood Hall. He also had to buy, use that money for the chairs. He later added a course called The Principles of Delineation, Color, and Chiaroscuro and a History of Painting, and his salary increased to $1,200. The program, which, which, with, with, which grew into what is now the Eskenazi School of Art, Architecture, and Design, was said in a, a 1941 History of IU to be the third oldest art department in an American university or college. Brooks' youthful enthusiasm and East Coast sophistication made him a bit of a novelty on campus as well, as well as the butt of jokes in the university yearbooks. Brooks was reared in Gloucester, Massachusetts, but not as the descendant of fishermen, but as the son of a lawyer from one of the town's prominent old families. 
1897 cartoon shows him with a top coat and cane, perhaps in the university's Dunn's Meadow, with the caption, are there bears in those woods? <laughs> Hinting that he is a city fellow who is unfamiliar with rural life. The accompanying verse, students of art, jokingly suggested the dubious impact of Brooks's classes on the aesthetic choices of his students, whose newfound love of art, it was said, had led to a rash of decorating their dorm rooms with food product labels. A caricature from 1909 showing him in a chef's attire and a poem Professor Brooks entertains lampooned his elegant taste in food, art, and fashion. Another from 1908 shows him dressed as a fireman, referring to a time he apparently discovered flames in a classroom building. As with the other captions, the humor focuses on Brooks as an esthete outsider, describing him as a member of the Order of Bachelors and an expert on etiquette, stating that he'd yelled, conflagration, conflagration, <laughs> a word unfamiliar to local firefighters, <laughs> and that when dousing a later hen house fire, he didn't even get his trousers on priest. And a former IU grad, undergraduate and friend of Brooks described the fine arts professor as a character with an odd appearance and unusual personality, but who remembered him for his wit, puckish glee, fine draftsmanship, worldly knowledge of art and literature, and, a, and for his brilliant, racy monologues. Brooks professed a Victorian belief in the power of art to transform people's lives and felt that a treasure house of architecture, sculpture, and painting was as essential to the study of the liberal arts as the university's libraries. Although IU President Joseph Swain worried about his youth and inexperience, he felt that, quote, on the whole, he has the right training and spirit, and I'd rather risk him than a man who has less culture and outlook, unquote. Brooks was prom promoted through the faculty ranks to instructor, from instructor to full professor, and in 1911, IU awarded him an honorary Master of Arts. In that same year, he took on the dual role as the first print curator at the John Heron Art Institute now the Indianapolis Museum of Art at Newfields. Heron's 1911 annual report lauded Brooks as representing as fully as anyone in the West, remembering we were the West then, the knowledge of art and, the cult and culture and emphasized his relationship to his friend and mentor um, at Harvard, Professor Norton. Brooks gave weekly Wednesday night lectures on various print topics. He also is believed to have shaped the Institute's print collection, although the IMA's archives have no information about his role in their early history. For IU's classroom, in addition to books and photographs, Brooks immediately started to acquire a collection of plaster casts after classical sculptures unfortunately now lost. An original artwork for use in teaching and in small traveling exhibitions. The works on paper were hung on the classroom walls and passed around for instruction and copying as a practice promoted by Ruskin. Central to his instruction was having the students learn to see by learning to draw. This meant focusing on design, beauty, and truth with pre rockolite precision, not on anatomy and modeling from life, as was taught at traditional art academies like Heron. Brooks counted his early museum among his proudest accomplishments at IU, stating, I take satisfaction in the knowledge that the department is equipped 
with not a few drawings which will always ensure its distinction and give real inspiration to its best students." Unquote. Recognizing the importance of the study of art in the original, Brooks felt that direct encounters with actual prints would awaken greater appreciation and critical thinking in his students than could simply be uh, merely uh, by seeing reproductions. As such, old master prints, in the absence of expensive paintings, were sought for the fine arts collection. Although small in the number, these works formed the core of the teaching curriculum. Among the earliest treasures were works by Durer, Rembrandt, and Hogarth. Reproductive engravings by printmakers like Raimondi after the works of masters like Raphael, Titian, and Tintoretto augmented the poor quality black and white reproductions of their works found in books and lantern slides. One of Brooks' own publication, From Holbein to, Wh to Whistler, from 1920, also focused on drawings and engravings. Although not quite a cabinet of curiosity of Whistler, uh, uh, although not quite the cabinet of curiosities of Ruskin's teaching collection, I use generally favored the same types of artworks found in Ruskin's museum in Sheffield, England, and at Harvard. The IU Fine Arts Collection even included a few watercolor copies by contemporary artists, including some by the Harvard professor Arthur Pope, who had an opportunity to travel and actually see the original masterworks. These copies gave IU students a rare glimpse into these famous artists' use of color, remembering that those reproductions were in black and white. Prints that provided a catalog of appropriate, also provided a catalog of appropriate subject matter to draw. Like Thomas Rowlandson's World in Miniature, consisting of figures for the illustrations of landscapes, see, landscape scenery. These were particularly useful, meant as a teaching aid for students and amateur painters, such as those found in the lower scene of Ruskin's um, prints, um, and uh, pattern books like this became popular in the early 19th century as a means of copying these images to put them in your paintings. This particular series had 40 plates of which the fine art department had 24 examples. The most well represented of all of the artists in the fine arts collection was the man who Ruskin touted as the greatest artist of the age the so-called father of modern art, J.M.W. Turner, was an important figure in any teaching collection. The fine arts collection had over 220 prints by him, more than 20% of the entire collection, including many plates from his treatise on artistic subject matter, the Liber Studiorum, Studiorum which was called the drawing book for art students suggested by the writings of Mr. Ruskin. Prints and drawings by other British artists, especially those who produced what was called the architectural picturesque views of medieval castles and cathedrals, were particularly favored by Brooks, who felt such image offered what we now call interdisciplinary approach for students interested in a variety of subjects on campus, like art, architecture, history, and literature. While the artists such as John Sell Cotman and Samuel Prout, whose architectural drawings were copied by the young Ruskin, were well known in their day and among the most widely represented in IU's teaching collection, they are now largely forgotten by museums, scholars, collectors, victims of changing taste and educational practices. When I ask students and I throw out the names Samuel, Cot Samuel Prout and John Sell Cotman, of course, nobody has ever heard of them because they are really just not very well known today. In 1912, Brooke took the quality of the teaching collection to the next level, but by buying 14 drawings from a Chicago collector 
of the contemporary American artist and designer associated with the American Renaissance movement, John Lafarge. The intersection of Lafarge's work with the decorative arts and architecture made them especially useful for the department's curricula. And you, here you can see some of his design for stained glass windows. In 1916, Brooks requested an additional $250 from the IU Board of Trustees um, to purchase an even more significant collection. He acquired a group of important 18th century drawings and prints from the estate of William Ward, a renowned student and copyist of John Ruskin. Brooks seemed to have a personal connection to Ward as he wrote the introduction for a book on John Ruskin's letters to William Ward in 1922. It is believed that Brooks also bought some of this collection for the John Heron Art Institute. Brooks published an article highlighting <coughs> IU's recent acquisition of these English drawings and watercolors in Art in America in 1918. This is particularly significant because in doing so, he set the precedent for using fine art to elevate the status of a university, not just being teaching aid. And he also sowed the seeds for museum quality art as being essential to the university's mission. Brooks left IU in 1922 to head the fine arts department at Swarthmore College. So what happened to the fine arts collection after his departure? There had already been some movement towards a greater professionalization in the department. In 1907, a Pratt Institute trained Robert E. Burke joined the department as an instructor, eventually becoming a professor and taking over as chair in 1922. Given his, the Pratt Institute's unique social mission to offer art education to those of any race, gender, or class in order to help them make their way up the ec economic ladder, the curriculum focused on practical application. Freehand mechanical and architectural drawings were seen, drawing was seen as the universal language in the foundation of all of its programs. However, instead of merely being tools for study, as, as Brooks thought, it was, they were viewed as more of a skill and an art form in their own right. Burke's training led to a greater emphasis at IU on art fundamentals, including new courses on perspective, composition, and design, as well as the plastic and graphic arts, as well as a sequencing of its classes. Students couldn't take what was now being called laboratory classes until they had a lecture on the history and theory of painting. The focus of the curriculum became more experiential. As a 1915 course catalog explained, the principal aim of laboratory courses is to help students understand pictures. In general, a person who tries, however ineffectually, to draw, to paint, to compose, will stand a better chance of appreciating good drawing, good painting, and good composition as one that who has not had that experience. In 1917, the department had added, by the 1917, the department had added graphic level, graduate level courses, and in 1921, it graduated its first student, finally, with a fine arts major. By 1925, students could also acquire additional studio training in cooperation with the John Heron Art Institute. The university's president, William Lowell Bryan, supported Burke's efforts and appointed the university's first artist in residence, T.C. Steele, in 1924. As, Brooke, as, as Bryan, President Bryan explained, I believe that we need beauty as much as we need truth. I believe that the university needs artists as much as it needs scholars. I rejoice in the presence of a few artists 
among our large number of scholars and look forward eagerly to the coming of more. Eventually, the Fine Arts Department had many important lecturers, visiting lecturers, in the 1950s and 60s, including Stephen Green, the sculptor David Smith, Jack Twerkoff, and Leon Golub. Burke's personal artistic style was that of a modern realist, with especially in landscapes. Although he had expanded the fine arts collection, his focus was on regional impressionism and the social realist. Indeed, there are no works reflecting major avant-garde art movements found in Europe and New York from the period, including cubism, surrealism, constructivism, and expressionism. Burke was joined by a second faculty member in 1928. The Romanian-born Harry Engel had received his first art education in Paris before graduating with a degree in art education from the University of Notre Dame. Although Engel's earlier painting style had much in common with Burke's, he was much more open to new ideas and eventually embraced a form of expressive abstraction. Engel try, also tried to improve the care and recognition of the early fine arts collection. Writing to President Bryan in 1935, he said, I discussed our print collection with experts, both at the Art Institute of Chicago and in the city, and I came to the conclusion that we have a very valuable collection containing many rare prints, drawings, and watercolors. You know that because of the inadequate facilities for their care and exhibition, these pictures have never been available to students and visitors. While Engel gained some funds for better housing in the appraisal by the Chicago dealer, his vision for a more accessible collection didn't materialize. It wasn't until 1941 that the university established its first true museum under the direction of the new chair of the department, Henry Radford Hope. However, Hope was a dedicated modernist and much of the material in the fi early fine arts collection was out of fashion and not of museum quality. I always ask the students when I'm talking to them about this collection, what does museum quality versus study quality mean? And they'll throw out some things and I always say, but think about what they said on Antiques Roadshow. It would, only, it would be worth so much more if it was only in better condition. So this early con collection wasn't collected with an eye to the best impression, the most important work by those individual artists, and it often was in very poor condition. Although a few choice pieces were accessioned into the museum's collection over the years, the vast majority apparently languished in the office of art history professor Dieter Timma, who taught the university's first course on the history of prints. Even after many of the boxes were transferred to the museum following Tim's death in 1978, perhaps through um, his wife, Denai, who served as the museum's conservator, most of these works still remain unidentified and unaccessioned on the museum shelves. The hiring of Henry Radford Hope by the young IU president, Herman B. Wells, was it saw a period of expansion. The post-war period reflected the rapid growth of the university with a huge influx of veterans on the GI Bill. Hope, as department chair, was instructed to grow the fine arts department to meet this demand. By 1956, he had raised the faculty's number from two to 16 full-time and 17 part-time faculty. Hope and Wells also had uh, a dream to start a formal museum. At the time, IU was the only major Midwestern university without some kind of art museum. Hope 
was one of the first art historians to have formal training in museum practices. In 1936, he attended a special school, um, special school for curators funded by the Louvre before continuing his studies at the Sorbonne and at um, getting his MA and PhD um, in art history from Harvard. At Harvard, he was one of the first students in Paul Sachs' Art of Connoisseurship course, which trained a whole generation of museum directors. The first question was, what kind of art collection should be gathered? Remembering that they weren't considering that teaching collection as part of the museum. So should it be regional art? They were obviously very close to Brown County. Should it be of American art? Should it be ancient art? Should it be modern art or even contemporary? What was ultimately decided is it should be encyclopedic. That is to serve all of the subjects taught at IU. This to me is shocking. I, they had very little money, no facility, and really no collection. So the first thing they had to do was build support and interest in the idea of a museum from the very fairly conservative state legislature, as well as even some of the IU's own faculty who still thought of art as a peripheral activity. IU's new Fine Arts Center was housed in Mitchell Hall behind the chemistry building. Sometimes I've heard it described as a barracks of some sort. It had a fireproof gallery, this was state of the art, that held, housed a rotating exhibition, of a, a series of month long exhibitions, very fast and furious. Many of the works were drawn from Hope's own collection and those of his friends and contemporary artists. The first exhibition was in November of 1941 and it was of 16 Brown County painters. In part to appease the local professional artists, they claimed they were selling things, um, professional artist who felt they were being overlooked. However, one of the next shows was of a more modern artist, American artist, Stuart Davis and Marsden Hartley, including one of the museum's very first major acquisitions, the mural swing landscape. The stated mission of the gallery was to bring temporary loan exhibitions to the campus so that students may have the opportunity to study and see original art works of art. Examples of diverse character will be brought to this gallery in order to show the multiple aspects of art, both past and present. Very similar mission to Brooks with much more of a broader, more universal view. The goal was to be of interest in the visual arts and begin to establish a permanent collection. In order to achieve the latter, Hope and his second wife, Sally, who was a Lily heir, established in 1948 the Hope Fund to help seed new acquisitions. Unlike the early fine arts teaching collection, the aim was to acquire representative museum quality material by the world's leading artist, from the leading art movements, and from the leading world cultural movements. Although Hope's scholarly interest and personal collection tend to lean towards modernism, he wanted the collection to serve, again, all the disciplines on campus. He also established a policy committee of faculty members from different departments to approve or decline new purchases or gifts. Some of the ex exhibitions, however, became so large, like the 30 masterpieces from the Metropolitan Museum and the Arts of Thailand, that they had to be staged in the IU Auditorium lobby. I remember also reading they hired some ROTC students to guard them. <laughs> By, the, by 1962, both the department and the museum collection had so vastly outgrown their digs in Mitchell Hall that the new fine arts building next to Showalter Fountain was built with the museum in the space that is now the Grunewald Gallery. If you've been there, you can imagine how small it was. In 1968, 
Hope was joined by a young architect and art historian, Thomas T. Sully, as an associate director of the museum. Sully had studied architecture at Yale and was hoping to finish his PhD in art history under Hope. Although he never completed the degree, he proved an excellent museum professional and took over the directorship of the museum in three years. He saw a period of unbelievable growth and the split of the museum from the fine arts department administratively. During his tenure, the collection grew from 4,000 to 30,000 objects. Partly funded by Solly's family wealth, he too was a lily heir. <coughs> Solly was said to have had a great eye and was a very savvy collector who paid well for, for good quality and had a, a good sense for work that was still being undervalued, like photography or ceramics. An example of this is that when the museum hosted an exhibition from the Hallmark collection of Saul Steinberg's work, the illustrator you might know from The New Yorker, Sully quickly reached out to the dealer, Sidney Janis, to purchase five of his drawings and one of his prints in 1977. These works are now included in the Magic Ledger exhibition currently on view at the museum. The building of a new museum, which Sully wanted to be of the quality comparable to the art it housed uh, by the renowned architect I.M. Pei, was dedicated in 1982 under Sully's guidance. During this period, the museum became recognized as one of the top university museums in the country, due in part to the depth and quality of the collection, including many masterworks by artists like Emile Nolde, Jackson Pollock, Marcel Duchamp, we have this Cycladic figure, as well as down on the bottom corner, I included a very famous Saul Steinberg drawing that's now on view. As well as for the strength of its staff as well and its fine facilities. After Sully retired in 1986, the museum's former curator of Western art after 1800, Heidi Gelt, took over as director. During a long period of reduced funding from the university, the focus shifted to fundraising and the utilization of the collection, including the establishment of curatorial endowments, more public programs, and student curated exhibitions, such as the collection of Vincent Price. Although there were still some important purchases, more of the acquisitions were gift, many based on the long-time relations, long relationships, such as those from the estate of the widow of Italian Renaissance scholar Ulrich Middledorf, the collection of IU professor and print historian Dieter Timma, the expressionist works from German immigrants Bernard and Kola Haydn, the estate of Morton C. Bradley Jr., one of the last descendants of IU's first president, and Tiepolo drawings from Columbus, Indiana, curator and philanthropist, the late Tony Moravec. After Heidi's retirement, the museum's current director, David Brenneman, formerly of the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, was hired. His collecting focus has turned toward, more towards contemporary work, especially by women and artists of color, although he is also aware of the important opportunities available through working with artists, artist estates or foundations, such as the Saul Steinberg Foundation, whose current gift of, large, of drawings forms the core of the current exhibition, as well as with gallerists and curators and collectors. Brenneman's tenure also overlapped with the museum's name change to the Sydney and Lois Eskenazi Museum of Art. Here you can see David with the donors. And a major interior renovation that included includes a new center for prints, drawings, and photographs on the third floor. And you, here you can see the new study room. I wrote about the fine arts collection and the department's origin 
in a short introduction to a 1991 faculty exhibition catalog, which coincided with the museum's 150th anniversary. And in 1996, I organized two exhibitions, Art in the Original, Selections from the Early Fine Arts Collection, one of the first time any of that material had been exhibited, and faculty artists, past and present, in conjunction with the 100th anniversary of the Fine Arts Department's first classes. And I revisited and expanded this research for in an article, Alfred Mansfield Brooks, the man who brought art to IU for the 200, the Bicentennial Magazine in 19, I'm sorry, in 2019. I brought some extra copies um, of that for anybody who might want one. In retirement, I hope to expand this research into a full length book on the history of IU's fine art department. Thank you. to take any questions? Did you mention Mitchell Hall? Yeah. I don't remember it, but that's still a... No, it was torn down. Oh. Yeah, it was torn down. I think for an expansion, one of the expansions of the chemistry building, it would, like so many of the fine arts departments building were, again, these, I always call them quick and dirty, these quick and dirty kind of barracks buildings for that great expansion after the war with all the incoming students. Many of them still existed oh my gosh, until maybe an, a decade or so ago, and we're still being used around campus for art studios. They were not in good condition, because again, they weren't meant to be long-lasting buildings. Yeah? No, they really were. They really were, because they really weren't well cataloged or identified, and again, they weren't museum quality. They really were a teaching collection. And they, over time, during my tenure, I actually took more of them out of that collection and accessioned them, but there still are a lot there that, again, aren't in good condition and still probably need to be cataloged in accession, maybe even just as a study collection, rather than as part of the museum's permanent collection. So there's still more to be done on that. Anybody else? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, it's really unclear to me how they made that distinction. I imagine it meant the use of more tools for drafting. I imagine it was more architectural drawings, and that was how they were distinguishing between, you know, sketching. Thank you. Oh, yeah. find that that might be something I might be able to find more because he was so following Ruskin's idea that were transferred to Cambridge Massachusetts to Bloomington but there was no mention of that and we had no record again all this art was under the bursar list for department equipment um, but they didn't include any kind of those kind of tools um, and again, that, that equipment budget he get, was given, $250, wasn't just for artwork. It was probably meant primarily for chairs and tables, you know, as well as for things, like I said, books, old lantern slides, uh, some of the reproductive um, drawings, um, photographs that were in the book for teaching by even Burke in the 20s were these horrible half-tone reproductions in black and white. So again, you realize just how limited artists in Indiana, in the West at that time, and were, were really limited in their access to the great artworks of the world. They really couldn't see much. 
All right. Well, thank you again for having me. And um, I, again, please come and take some of these magazines.